So thank you all for coming to this conference here. And uh, so, you know, like 36 years ago, I got this crazy idea. I just decided somehow, made up my mind that it was possible to stage theatrical presentations, you know, or whatever you want to call them, without any humans and then with just machines playing the parts of humans. And, uh, you know, I just had this idea and it wasn't really that much connected to it, but it just, I had it and I instantly knew that that was how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. And so, so far, that's pretty much what has happened. I've spent my life since then trying to figure out ways to make machines and uh, make machines that have like a certain level of personality that can allow them to be accepted as actors in environments or shows or whatever you want to call them, real time interactions between not just one machine but many, as many machines as possible and, and to make the machines as, as extreme as possible. And uh, so that's, that's pretty much what I've, what, I've, what I've done. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the whole process of personalizing or characterizing the machines because it's really, it's really an essential part of it because when it gets right down to it, if you're trying to stage an event in real time and uh, you're dealing with a machine, you know, at least with the, the uh, the resources that someone like me has, which is you know not money resource, maybe a little bit of cleverness and spare time or whatever you want to call it, but you've got to you know you've got to cut corners really. You can't you know I can't make a machine you know I can't spend like they do over at Boston Dynamics like twenty five million dollars to make a machine that can run like a horse you know because I don't have twenty five million bucks and you know no one's going to take. Uh, doing shows of machines really seriously enough to provide that kind of money. So I've got to cut corners and I've got to figure out a way to make the machine, make a, make a person who's watching a show feel like they're seeing something that somebody spent $25 million on. So I've got to, you know, you've got to characterize it to make that happen. And, and you know, the, the, of course, the, 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 the reason to do that is because if you're doing a show without people in it and these machines don't have a lot of uh, depth of character, I guess you'd call it. You've got to uh, you've got to use more than one. You know, I found that out really early on. As I started thinking about how to do all this stuff, I realized that you had to have more than one, and that you had to really figure out a way to make make the the key figures in the performances, these real time performances. Really, you had to really make them. Uh, you had to have, you had to make them in a way that they create an impression that pulled the whole event together and really drew people into it. I mean, the great thing is, is that there's these controversies that are from time immemorial. Uh, you know, one of them is the idea of what's, what is the difference between a living thing and a thing that's not living? Where does that point? I mean, Aristotle, I think, was the first one that really got down and dirty with it, of like, he, he, he's the first one that really asked the question in a really serious way. But, you know, it's never been resolved. Like, what is, you know, is a virus alive? Is a bacteria, you know, we, we think bacteria are alive, but do we think a virus is alive? What's the difference between a virus and a crystal? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's something that's unresolved. And because it's unresolved, I mean, there's a reason why it's unresolved. It's unresolved because people... Ha, you know, there's there's no consensus that there really is a barrier. I mean, there's and and the more that science gets into uh, how matter is configured on an, on an atomic level and beyond that, the more it's understood that there's really the difference between a rock and a human is really hard to discern on a certain level. And, uh, you know, you have other artists, of course, that, like Theo Jurgen, I think his name is, the Dutch artist who makes the, you know, he's got a real focus on that, too. He makes machines that sort of walk down the beach by themselves. And he has a whole theory about environments where you're creating things, you're essentially creating living personalities. And so, uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's, that's what I've always tried to do with these machines. And what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is uh, a flame personality. Because we all know there's lots of different kinds of flame. I mean, you know, in movies, there's like, you know, flame, you know, there's, ha there's, there's the chaotic flame, a house burning, there's like a soldier with a flamethrower. Uh, you know, you go to an art event, you'll see like a propane flame, typically. 
And each one of these frame, flames has a certain kind of character. I mean, personally, if I was going to have a dinner party, I wouldn't invite the propane flame. Because the <laughs> propane flames are the ones you see like at Burning Man or all the other places. They're the most boring flame personalities. You know, they really are. But, uh, but you know, like something like a rocket engine. You know, like a rocket engine I would invite to a party, you know, if it was a person. And so, you know, fl I, you know I'm of the belief that, that, that machines, you know, flamethrower type machines or flame effects generating machines have to be, they, they can be endowed with a certain personality too. And so I'm working on a machine now, uh, right now currently, which is a flamethrower machine that mounts to another machine. And I'm going to show you this little movie here. So this is the flamethrower that goes on to the Moto Man robot. We've got a cooling fan from a Bradley fighting vehicle here. Spins up at around 8,500 RPM using this big old honking two-stroke motor. It's got about 50 horsepower. The air comes out here gets mixed in with finely vaporized diesel fuel and then if it was in the shop it would melt my decal control panel with about a 20 foot white flame. That's going to be slung around by the Moto Man robot. Yeah, so I think that, I don't know if any of you read the article by David Peskovitz about Bot and Dolly. Bot and Dolly is the, the special effects company, the robotics company that did the effects for, most notably in the recent history, is uh, Gravity, the movie Gravity. And I think that the founder there, I remember reading the article and the founder said, yeah, our theory is that we're bringing the camera to the actor. And so I heard that and I think, God, you know what I'm doing? I'm bringing the flame to the audience, <laughs> you know? So... You know, you can, you can imagine like a 20-foot flame on an on a industrial robot moving around in that kind of sinuous way that only robots can move around. You're creating kind of a dynamic there between like a very highly developed flame, a very highly personalized flame, and a very utilitarian machine, which... Uh, Love how the way they move around. There's no fire dancer that could really do that. Whoa, that part. It's a giant tour in the World Series. You want to put something in the John or something? Nah, none of that. Nah. We don't believe well, in sports here. <laughs> yeah. That's Keep. why we do this. See, we got a nice test stand here. Made from a Harbor Freight, highly modified Harbor Freight motor stand. And uh, that's it. So, to, you know, to get, you know, to get, you have to really go, and with all these machines, you have to go to special lengths to really make something different out of it. And the reason that this flame device is so different from other flame devices that I've made is that I'm putting some energy into it. For one thing, uh, you know, we've got it mounted to like a robot that anybody who looks at it, you know, there's the objective sense that it's expensive. It's a $50,000 robot. I didn't pay 50,000 bucks for it. I didn't pay hardly anything for it, but it still has that, you know, it's, a, it's something that could have been used by somebody who had sense for something really practical, like someone could have made money with it or, you know, someone could have made a practical thing that you might have used someday, you know, but not me. You know, I'm going to use it to sling around a flamethrower. Now it's rated for 50 kilograms. So, you know, I, you know, there are laws that I abide by, and those are the laws of physics. So the, you have to have a light flamethrower. So, you know, I, had to, I went for a cooling fan from a Bradley fighting vehicle, the outside of which is magnesium. It's also a very high-performance fan. That fan can spin at 12,000 RPM. You can put about 100 horsepower into that fan. Where are you going to get 100 horsepower from? You could just get a, I could just get an electric motor, you know, and it would just kind of buzz along. But I could also take a jet ski motor with 65 horsepower 
and put an expansion chamber on it and have it be louder than the loudest racing motocross engine you ever heard in your life and smoking and vibrating. And I could use that instead, and that's what I decided had to be done. You know, you've got a nice lightweight motor, and you'll notice, again, I want to make the comparison with my big brother robot companies, Boston Dynamics. All of their machines, if you listen to the sound tape, they're all two-stroke motors. You all hear one, they all got that same kind of droning soundtrack. Well, this is going to be even more like that, and you're also going to get the... Uh, what is the spinning speaker effect? I don't remember. But yeah, you get a Leslie effect because you're rotating it around all the time really fast. So you're going to get all kinds of weird sound aberrations. Again, this is something that, you know, a thing that doesn't make consistent noise is a thing that makes, it's, it's, it's also a characteristic of something that's alive. So you've got something that's really loud and really scary and also makes a certain kind of flame. Now, the flame that's going to come out of this because... You know, I make, I've got, uh, basically, here's the calculations for it in a quick minute here, just basic stuff. I get 12,500 12, feet per minute, so that adds up to, uh, what, 1,000 pounds of air. No, 71 pounds a minute of air, which means I can run it 10 gallons a minute of diesel. Now, 10 gallons a minute of diesel doesn't really mean anything unless you vaporize it a certain way. And that's what is happening with this machine. A regular nozzle for, you know, vaporizing something, vaporizing fuel is, uh, you know, is going to, is, it makes a certain kind of controlled flame. Like a burner usually will have like a little sprayer that makes a little controlled flame that's just enough for the furnace. I mean, to make something really radical and really expressive, you need like a, you know, I looked around for a new kind of technology because I wanted to make a new kind of flame. So I found that a company makes these nozzles, Parker makes these nozzles for jet engines. And these are uh, macro spray nozzles. These are like the latest technology. They're chemically milled. But the, the cool thing about them is they've got all these crazy passages in those little arms there. These are called spider nozzles. And so what they do is those nozzles agitate the fuel and they cause the droplets that come out to be all, like 99% of the droplets are all the same, very tiny, tiny size. And you can uh, put uh, huge amounts of pressure in them. You can, you can run the pressure up to uh, uh, 3,000 pounds per square inch. The theoretical maximum for vaporization of fuel where you still get a, an, a positive effect is about 12,000 PSI, but I'm not going to get 12,000 PSI. I'm not going to deal with that. These guys have found a way to get really consistent vaporization with only three, two to 3,000 PSI. So it's also, you can put as many of those nozzles in that spider as you want. So you can get whatever volume you need to get. But what you get is you get a very finely atomized fuel coming out of there. And you get a really, really high quality, what I, what I call a high quality frame. Like a really, like, a, like a, for the flame connoisseur, it's like a, the Ferrari of flames. Because you don't have any, there's no spurious little spurts of unburned fuel. You get like, you know, you, it's made to generate uh, a spray inside of a jet engine so that you're getting as much efficiency as possible. That's what these nozzles are all about. They're maximum efficiency, but you also get maximum intensity out of it, which means every little bit of that fuel is going to come out as heat and fire. And you'll get, a, you'll get a flame that's, uh, it changes the color of the flame. So we'll have a flame that's white, uh, bright white, almost like a flash cube. So all these things, all these things that go into making something as simple as a flamethrower are all about making it, when a, when a person's in a show and that thing starts s s waving around and firing, your audience, you know, the first thing people do is they kind of like, you know, you, you'll, you'll see something that's unfamiliar like that. You go, whoa, how does this happen? And then if, you know, whether you're an engineer or not, you're going to, there are all these hallmarks of peculiarity that they have that are, are what creates a personality. And the scarier, I found that the scarier the personality you can create with a machine, the more likely that, that the, the, the experience of going to one of these events blends into a believable landscape where the machines seem as if they're alive. And so 
these are the kind of decisions that go into making these, mach these machines and characterizing them in a way that makes them believable actors. And uh, I've always, from a very young age, you know, I came to the conclusion uh, probably, you know, when, when I was probably, I don't know, 10 or something like that. I had this idea that, you know, I read, you know, I read popular science. I read all these science things when I was a kid. And I was like, wow, like, here I am just like some kid. And then there's the scientists out there that, like, we've got it all figured out, you know. And they know how to do it. And they're like, how am I going to get to where they are where I just know what everything is? They're just like, they were like these weird gods. And uh, what I realized, I realized it because my brother, my older brother, who is the person you always look up to, he was like out there like working on motorcycles and stuff like that. And I was like, God, you know, how does he do that? And then like I got, I got a motorcycle. I started working on it. I realized you don't really need to know anything. You just have to understand a few things. You have to understand like the machine to just on the fundamental level. You have to understand what its DNA is. You have to understand like what is going on in the machine, like what it was given by its creator. And once you understand that, then you can start, you, you, can, you really have a feel for it. And then you can look at it like a, like, a, like, a, like a veterinarian or a doctor. You can look at it and go, what's wrong with you? Is there something wrong? You can start asking the machines questions. And I started, I realized that it worked. I mean, I've, I had a motorcycle. I was like, what's wrong with you, you know? Like, why, why, why don't you work? And then I just, rather than, you know, and I looked in the manuals. I didn't really understand that stuff because I didn't have the technical background. But I realized that if you understand the fundamentals, like this was an engine, these are wheels, these are bearings, you understand what the DNA of the device is, then you can really fix it. And once I understood that you could fix it without really knowing really what a scientist knows about something, you know, that was, a, that was a very important lesson to me. And pretty soon I was fixing things that no one else I knew could fix. When I was just a teenager, I was like, wow, this is, this is like, you know, I'm winging it, but it's like working. And then, uh, you know, that, that is something that stayed with me. You know, I went through, I, I worked in the, out, out there in the world and stuff like that. But then when, I, when it came right down to it, when I had to make that decision about what I was going to do for the next however many years I lived, I decided that, you know what, I can do it. You know, I can just fake it. I can, like, pr I don't really have to be a scientist. I don't have to get a PhD at, at Berkeley or something like that. I can just really understand the genetics of these things. And then, and then not only that, but I can modify them. And I can basically teach them through modifications and combinations. I can teach them to be a certain kind of person or a certain kind of personality, a certain type of machine. And so... That's what's really, I think, one of the things that's really held the whole I, thing together, you know, because none of these shows, when you've got, it's one thing to have one machine, but you've got 20 or 30, 40, 50 machines together, and you don't have a gazillion dollars behind you. It's all about your intuition. It's all about, like, knowing, like, when you need to, like, look at something. It's all about really understanding what you've created and what's, what's there. So anyway, that's just, you know, that's just my take, and I try to, we, you know, I, I do the shows as a way, basically, to prove that uh, they are alive. So. Uh.